Kaintra and happy Family Day for those in Canada. Happy President's Day for those in the US. And I'm back again with Oscar. And what a brilliant week we had in La Liga this week, Oscar. Yeah, it was a great week full of lots of goals, lots of high scoring games, a few controversies as well. And it's a typical La Liga weekend at this point. Yeah, yeah. That's man. enjoyable. And that, you know, the terrorists aren't like terrorizing La Liga anymore and the goals have come back. Yeah, you're right. It was the week of fresh. But let's, let's start with the biggest game of the week, the Bass Derby, Athletic versus Real Sociedad. And did you see the scoreline coming? Because Athletic had been beating Real Sociedad since 2019. I did not see the scoreline coming. Yeah, because of the fact that Athletic had been going this derby for so long, I kind of rooted for them to win this time. And typically, recent backs derbies haven't been decided by more than two goals, so I wasn't expecting a lot. But then the last 20 minutes happened. Yeah. Yeah, it was a strange game because the game started and it was mostly a nutritional game. Athletic, obviously, they had like more of the chances. They had more of the play. But it felt like one of those games that were that was possibly going to end 0-0. Zero, zero. But it's, I wouldn't have imagined... <laughs> At six minutes six six, I was like, okay, this is gonna be a zero zero or one zero game or something. And then the goals kept on flowing and it, it was it was beautiful to see because Athletic, they're one of those teams that are excellent in set pieces. And the first two goals were from good set pieces. Yeah. It is in a tight game like this, in a derby, in a final an important game or whatever it is in set pieces will always be key. Athletic as we know, are very good at set pieces. So they really took advantage of those two in quick succession. And the, the, the funny thing is that it just, like, it's not just the set pieces. From the start of the second half, Athletic dominated Real Sociedad physically in possession. Like, they really pinned them back. What Marcelino did, he pushed his wingers really high. It was like a 4-2-4. I real so said that for whatever reason, whether it's European exertions, they couldn't cope. No. But after being overwhelmed for so long, the set pieces just came and then the goals just kept pouring and pouring. Yeah, and feels they just collapsed. Like um, my commentator was saying this, it's like it felt Ralph so sad were the more tired team. And their excursions to Europe showed. Because even against Leipzig, they looked very tired. They looked like they couldn't handle that like intensity and it's something, it's been a theme of their season, not just at this point of the season. You look at the games against Betis, where they lost 4-0 at the BM Marine. They lost 4-0 at Anoeta and Copa del Rey. It feels when they play against a very intense team, they tend to collapse. Yeah, it's, it feels that way. Like, if you go at them with intensity, one touch passing, you know, they can't seem to handle it. I don't really know exactly why that's the case. I can't. I, I used to think it was like tiredness over the course of the season, but then against us at the beginning of the season, it was the same case. The intensity we showed that they just overwhelmed them. So it's something that I think it's something that they need deep investigation into to find out why this is the case. And this is something I don't like doing, but like, do you think the manager's job should be in question? Because no, no. they haven't played. I don't think it's. I think it's. They've gotten some bad trashings this season, but I don't. I think the fact that they're a consistent European team should be good enough for now. If they want to progress from a consistent European team to like a top four team, maybe a managerial change may be needed to yeah. take that next level. But for now, I doubt. I'll be very surprised if he was sacked. A new reason. Yeah, because the reason I'll say this is because even last season we saw that in the 6 1 thrashing at Anueta by mm. Barcelona, Manchester United went there and beat them quite easily f mm. by four goes to zero as well. So it seems like something needs to change in this team. Like they've seemed to settle into this like funk where they they do well enough to get the points to get them to Europe. I, I'm not sure whether this season might be enough for them because of how strong the teams are around them. But it feels like mm -hmm. to get to that next level, 
they something needs to change. Either it's the personnel staff or the managerial staff for me. Definitely, and one thing that definitely needs to change is their medical team because the injuries they get yeah. are really are too much, and the duration of the injuries are too long. So, yeah, like you said, a few things have to change for him to keep moving forward. Yeah, and David Silva is another question because I don't think he's lived up to expectations since he's come to La Liga in the last two seasons. Yeah, I feel the same way. Last season, I was kind of okay with what he brought to the table. This season, not at all. It's been quite disappointing, to be honest. But then he's old now, so it's more or less expected. I think once I said that Real Sociedad, they, they need that, that silver type of player, but a younger one at this point because, you know, he's getting on. Rafinha could be a good addition. He's a, he's been a good addition so far, yeah. but, you know, they need a more permanent solution there so to yeah. provide spark to the team. Yeah, because they're missing a big um, other guard-sized hole. Mm-hmm. And um, how do you see them doing in Europe against Leipzig? Because the first leg was, although they got a very good result in Germany, by the performance, they didn't deserve that result. Yeah. And I saw that Leipzig really lead into their opponent this week. So given that they've just suffered a demoralizing defeat and they've lost, and Isak is probably not going to play. Marino is out for the next few days with the concussion. I, I kind of worry for them against Leipzig. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel I worry the same too. And another team that gave a shocking European performance was Real Madrid uh, against PSG. Did you see this game? Like, I felt this was their worst performance of the season. I, I, that, that performance was so bad for Real Madrid. PSG were excellent, but Real Madrid, they just, I don't know what they were thinking. Like, why, like, why would you just be so passive? It didn't make sense at all. I don't think rushing players back from injury will have to do it because no matter who they played, I felt the message would have been the same. Like, yeah. you're Real Madrid, you have very good players. If you go at this PSG team, you will get a lot of joy from them. But they didn't. But do you think there was a fear of PSG? There was a fear of a counterattack because the Real Madrid defended very, very deep. It's, in some ways, it felt like it was Real Madrid playing... Like Real Madrid felt like they, they were Elche and PSG felt like they were Real Madrid and they were just like defending for the 0-0. Zero, zero. And Ancelotti said that those were the wrong tactics. But in some ways, you could sort of see what it was going for in that, okay, if I get a 0-0, zero, zero, that's not a bad result. And we come to the Bernabeu and we have to win. Even the pace team, Real Madrid have a very fast back line. Yeah. So I don't buy into that fear of PS arguments because the only person for PSG that's going to actively run in behind is Mbappe. Yeah. Messi and Di Maria aren't running in behind. And you have Militao who's fast, Alba who's fast, Carvajal who's fast, but he had a tough time. Mendy who's very, very fast. So I don't really buy the PS. I really, I'm still confused as to why they set up like that. I don't think I'll ever find a satisfying answer. Do you think the fatigue played a factor? Because, like, one thing, like, honestly, like, looking at this game, I was like, if PSG are going to be Real Madrid, they're possibly going to beat them in the counterattack. And Mm -hmm. I felt in terms of the areas where PSG are better than Real Madrid are possibly in attack. And maybe the wingbacks are better. But I felt Real Madrid would have dominated this game in the midfield. And that's not what we saw because Paredes and Verratti, they had an excellent game. Danilo as well, like mm-hmm. they didn't give Cruz, Casemiro, Modric any joy, and that's not something you would expect from that front three. Is that are we beginning to see? I know they've been brilliant in La Liga this season, but is this a sign of like maybe a terminal decline of that front three? I I don't, I don't really think it's a decline. I do think that in games where there's more intensity, that they could probably add Valverde to those three yeah. and just play Benzema and Vinny as a diamond. Like, 
Zidane did some, Zidane, when, why they were so successful in Europe three years ago was not just the three of them, Isco added ex, something extra to them. So I think playing Valverde could be a solution in addition to those three, because those three are excellent on their day. As for why they got dominated, well, normally I don't expect them to like always seek to dominate it. And I think like those three are okay with being a bit passive, but this was way too passive for yeah. anything they've done before. And it felt like the performance like sipped into La Liga this week because mm-hmm. in the first half against Alaves, it was almost like it was almost unwatchable for, for the first like 50, 60 minutes. It felt like two mid-table teams like trying to break each other down. And but the quality of the show with Asensio's goal, both which was fantastic, and the second and third goals were like the second goal was brilliant. I believe the third was a penalty. Uh, so yeah, it feels like they're not they're not really enjoying their best moment around Madrid. They yeah. struggled for goals recently. They scored three goals last week, but like it's against Alaves, right? Yeah. Up until Asensio scored that goal, they had only scored one goal this month, and that was his goal against Granada. Yeah. And and I think they haven't scored a first half goal at home this year. I'm almost sure they haven't scored a first half goal away from home, except in the Copa del Rey against Alcoyano. So yeah, these are I don't know. It's, I think it's a combination of fatigue, the fact that the teams they've played against recently are teams that will sit back and frustrate them. And those are the kind of teams that you need individual quality, like a shot from outside the box to beat. Yeah. So a combination of all these things have really made Real Madrid dip a bit. Yeah. But the thing is, like, despite all this, they still extended a league because Sevilla are not having the greatest moments. And it sort of showed against Espanyol, like Espanyol is a tough place to go, as Barcelona and Real Madrid have found out. Mm-hmm. But in this game, I felt I felt Sevilla, they, they did a Sevilla in the sense where they scored a goal and they were just waiting for things to go their way and things didn't go their way this time, uh, especially from the refereeing decisions, the goal by there and some of the injuries. Yeah. And how, how, do you, how do you rate this referee's decision? Because like it, it, he was scandalous. I, I don't really want to talk about this referee because I might say something. <laughs> like this referee has since he's I started not seeing him in La Liga. He has always just made me confused as to why I watch football. Like, like he has no control of games that he takes charge of. He's just sad how he's always flashing cards. But that's by the by the honest truth. And it pains me to say this, <laughs> is that Espanyol, even without the referees' nonsense, were much better and severe on the day. Yeah. And they should have won. Yeah, they should have. They have, they have the chance. Sevilla, to- yeah, you are right. The, this whole subject of being too passive when you score one goal. Like, you can't... Espanyol are a good enough team at home to punish you if you sit back against them. And the injuries as well and suspensions... Generally, luck is not on Sevilla's side. No, not at all. Because in this game again, they couldn't play. Like they, like I feel Sevilla, they're, they're the type of team. Like if they play their best eleven, mm-hmm. they look very good. But if you take out a couple of pieces from that eleven, they start to wilt. And mm-hmm. they were unlucky with injuries. Like Rekic got injured and in, against Inamo Zagreb, and he was his son, who's really grown this season as a yeah. centre back, being played in his proper position, mm-hmm. and. Again, Martial gets injured early, early in this game. And his Reese form is is horrible at the moment. Rafa Mera did a good job this week, mm-hmm. which is something that he's starting to do. But yeah, it feels like they need they need something to click because if they don't, they might be out of this title race even by next week. Because who comes to Sevilla next week, Oscar? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Playing against Real Betis next week. Yeah, it's not yeah. going to be easy. I think since Real Betis beat them in the cup, they've kind of like taken a back step. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I feel that game has affected them a bit mentally. It, it might be reactionary to say, but they haven't been the same since then. So I guess beating Real Betis in their current condition could be a way to 
light that fire in them again. Yeah, I feel this games they're sort of like the classicals where it's like it might not matter, like it might not make a big difference in like who wins a title or something, but it makes a big difference in the shift of momentum. Even yeah. when I remember Lopetegui's first season and he was really struggling and he won that derby game and that changed Sibia's complexion. But they're, they're going to play against a Betis team that has been in superb form against Zenit St. Petersburg. They, they showed a different face, a more mature face, because they went into that game without Fekir, they went into that game without Canales, and they scored goals for fun. They were, they were bright going forward. Defensively, they were suspect, but against a top European team, that was a very much a performance from them, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a very good performance from your Betis away from home. Yeah. And yeah, it was a, it was quite a, it was a good game for Zenit also played really well. That yeah. game should have probably ended more than 3-2 yeah. their way. Uh, yeah, it was a mature performance in the end to just hold on to that away win and and yeah, at the Via Marine they could probably do a better job of closing things down defensively. Yeah, because yeah, even this weekend they also like I also felt it wasn't it wasn't spectacular, but it's this type of performance that you see like okay, this is a top team, and they played yeah. against Mallorca. Mallorca they make things a bit life a bit difficult for teams apart from Real Madrid surprisingly, <laughs> and uh, and they they had a setback when Maruki scored, but you could tell that eventually Betis were just going to break them down and get them. Yeah. Like. It's not just the quality that they've improved this season. It's their resolve. Like, that resolve that you just don't want to give up. You want the three points. That's something that has really grown in them this season. And that's why for the past two months, I've seen them as a genuine top four contender. Like, it's not, they're not just there for being their sake. They're there to, you know, really make a statement. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And a word of to Mallorca, like I feel they really improved with mm. signing Maruki in up front, signing Sergio Rico at the back, because those were two problem areas they've had. And it feels like it feels like there's more goals in them. They're more there's more danger in them than in the early parts of the season. Yeah, exactly. Maruki has been excellent. He's provided goals, some assists. Sergio Rico, I mean, he's an improvement on Manolo Reina, but that wasn't exactly hard. Yeah. As I said, Dorito has still had one or two moments that I've questioned his goalkeeping. Sure, true. true. So but I, don't, I don't really know about him, but up front, they definitely look more dangerous. Kubo is playing well. Kangin is making a difference. Angel, is, yeah. oh, he always plays well. Dani Rodriguez, he's an excellent pro. Yeah. So, yeah, I do feel America have, America will stay up. Yeah, they have a good enough defense and an attack. If they improve, they'll stay up comfortably. True. And a team with terrible defense at the moment is Valencia. And wow, they got a fresh in against Barcelona uh, on Sunday <laughs> Sunday morning. And how good was, how good would you rate Aubameyang's performance? Because it's the second time played against Valencia, the second hat trick against Valencia. It was, a, it was a very good performance from Aubameyang. He like, the runs, the way he scored his goals, especially the second one, was what I've been crying out from a Barcelona forward since Suarez left. Like, make runs into the six yard box. Because we've had too many players that, you know, they don't have that run in them. Yeah. But that's how, how lots of strikers score their goals. You just have to get into that area and put the ball in the net. Yeah. And besides Aubameyang, it was a really positive performance. You know, the the goal, the two, the second and third goals were well constructed moves. Uh, Valencia made it a bit difficult in the second half, but then you know we managed to see it out. But but the game was already over, and it felt like Barcelona they scored at the right times. And because, mm -hmm. for example, after Valencia scored the 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 first goal, and it was three one, Barcelona scored the fourth like soon after that. And that's yeah. not something that we saw like in the other collapse they had against Celta Vigo because in that collapse, Celta Vigo scored the second goal very quickly. And that's yeah. and it made things for a very uncomfortable game. And in this top four race where it seems like goal difference is going to count a lot, it was important that Barcelona kept on scoring. Yeah. It, we'll get to Atletico a little bit later, but seeing that Atletico have scored more goals than us but have considered more, I'm like, 
we need some big margins of victory between now and the end of the season just to get that keep the goal difference healthy because it might come down to that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, this was a good result. We scored four. We haven't scored four. We've only scored four like two other times this season, so it's good progress. And it's come like Christmas gifts, like it's four scored four twice in two weeks. And yeah. the performance against Napoli was something to like. I, I feel like before I've been like sort of like iffy about like whether this Barcelona form is uh false dawn, but like that performance against Napoli was very good. Like uh, against the top European team to play like mm-hmm. that and to play them off the park, it should have. Although it's a it's a poor result in quotation marks, it should have showed that mm-hmm. Barcelona are somewhat back into being a competitive team again. Yeah, it was a good performance, especially in the second half. But here's the problem. Here's my thing. Besides a few games, we've not we've like where we've been absolutely terrible. Most of our problems have come from playing okay or playing well and not taking advantage of it. So I'm still, I was still a bit upset by that Napoli game because it's like we had so many chances to put this game to bed and we just don't take them. So yeah. until that aspect like changes for the better, I wouldn't say that we've really made any decent step forward. And so is there a worry about the second leg when... Arsenal goes to the Diego Maradona Stadium. I'm not that I'm not worried about the second leg. I'm just like we'll we'll create chances, but taking them is the issue. I hope that we the fact that we if someone like Ferran is getting into good positions is a good sign. Yeah. So if you keep making those smart movements, you're going to score eventually. Sure. Whether it's an accident or you score a world, it's going to it's the law of averages. It's going to happen. So. Hopefully, it happens more often than not to the end of the season. Yeah, and Barcelona's top four challengers are Atleti, and they were in action against Osasuna after they, they slipped up midweek against Levante. And going to El Sadar is, well, it's, it's always a tough stadium. The atmosphere is always electric. And Atleti, they, in some ways, it was an Atleti, typical athletic performance of like 2014 to 2018 because they were... They were solid when they needed to be. They rolled their lock and they, they were efficient. Uh, Joff yeah. scored against his favorite opponents and Oblak was decent today or yeah. on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like when Felix scored his goal, instinctively I remember that he always has a team for scoring against us as soon as. Yeah. I think he scored a brace against them in 20, 1920, a brace against them last season. He scored, he gave that important assist to Lodi last season as well. So yeah, it's it's good to have a favorite opponent, I guess. And yeah, he was very good the, the other day. And, and it was important that Fletcher won this game because like hers as well as because this is one of those games where like it's it's okay to win against I know they didn't win against Levante, but if you if they beat Levante like 4-0, it would have been like or 4-3, it would have been like okay, but like this was the kind of performance where you're going into a tough away game, away place where Barcelona hasn't won this season. I doubt, I think if Real Madrid wins, they're going to really suffer. Sevilla didn't win there this season. And mm-hmm. you win there with like, with authority, like playing yeah. as a top team, like being resilient, which is something that Atleti have been shown this season. They haven't been resilient, but in this game they were. Yeah. It was let it, it didn't feel like a Jekyll and Hyde performance because recently they've been win one, lose one. But those wins, even those wins, like you said, they were chaotic wins. This win was a very good win because it showed composure, showed authority, showed resilience, and it's very timely because they have my United during the week. Yeah, yeah. And how how do you how do you see that going? Because my United over the weekend, they they had a, a sort of chaotic game. And the one area where I'll be scared for with Man United is the aerial game because they have Cristiano Ronaldo and Atleti, really, they haven't been strong, even in this game. Like, And that's something in this game that I was waiting to test because like Osuna, they're a team that they play the aerial game very well. And it seemed that Atleti lost the aerial battles. And 
Yeah. I worry for them against United because they have like tall players like Ronaldo, Rashford, Bruno, and and Pogba. And maybe that's where this game is lost for Atleti. Yeah, man. In general, Atleti have been terrible from set pieces, and we've seen so many times in this game that set pieces can make a difference whether you're playing well or not. So that's something they have to be worried about. I don't know. It's interesting. I don't really know how this game is going to pan out. I can see my United having more possession because it's right next team, but then is that possession just going to be the usual sterile possession? And will that let you like actually try to attack my United instead of just passively sitting back like they've been doing for the last few years? I don't really know how this one is going to go. It can be a thriller or it will be like a generic nil nil draw in the European yeah. game. Yeah, it feels like it's a game now that goes in them. And it's like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for this. I even took like a couple of days off just to watch like this game. And- <laughs> oh, you too, right? Yeah, so it, it'll, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. I expect, expect goals in this one. Uh, same thing. And let's, let's move on to Villarreal very quickly. Uh, they beat Granada 4-1, but I feel this was so unfair on Granada. Dan Jumar got a hat trick, but in the second half, Villarreal were holding up for dear life. Yeah. I mean, Granada had at least five penalty shots that weren't even considered. They had the cup, they had the goal disallowed. Like they they really made like the cup of Villarreal in the second half. And that's why it, the timing of Dan Jumar's third goal was crucial because Villarreal found it found life so difficult in the second half. But yeah, credit to Don Juma. He took his penalties well. His other goal was a great throwback goal, rounding the goalkeeper. We don't really see that anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was an efficient performance from Villarreal, I guess. Let's it could improve about, on it. Sure. Let's talk about that one moment where the third goal scored because I feel this is a pivotal moment because moments before, Sam Trezic <laughs> should have gotten a red card, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. But um, I forget who he had, but I like, believe it was Carlos Neva. But he should have gotten a red card there. And he's the player who provokes the penalty for the <laughs> third. And I feel that that's a pivotal mistake by the referee, where it sort of changed the dynamic of the entire game. And this is something that I don't really like that much in terms of refereeing and influencing games. Yeah. When the Chukweze headbutt happened, I'm like, surely they have to give this one. I kind of went away from watching the game for a bit. I came back, I saw he's still on the pitch. I'm like, how? <laughs> I'm like, did they, I'm like, I asked people, like, did they go to VAR at least? Because that looked like a surefire red card. Like, that's no different. That's worse than what PK did to um, Melamed the other day. And that was a red card for sure. Even, even worse than the Kunde thing, where like Kunde got. Was, oh, the, <laughs> and the, the refereeing in this league. Yeah, <laughs> it, it leaves a lot to be desired. And I, I hate to do this, but I just want to pick up that one Granada player, which is Uzini. is a new player, but yeah. my God, like he was like Vinicius 2018, 2019 level in terms of like decision making in the final third. <laughs> Yeah. He passed when he should have shot. He shot when he should have passed. Shot when he should have passed. Yeah, you, oh, like God. the first time he shot when he should have passed, and then the second time he was like, you know, I didn't pass the other time. Let me do it this time. Yeah. And then he almost he almost got, he considered a penalty and could have been sent up with one for fire. Yeah. So a very for a day for him to forget. Yeah, I think it was Gil Manzano was the referee, which is another referee who's like his experience, but like he makes lots of mistakes. Uh, let's not dwell too much on Granada because Villarreal, they have a huge game coming up against Juventus in the Champions League and Juventus this weekend they drop points to Torino so and it feels like Zlahovic hasn't gotten up to a, as much of a flying start so do you, see, do you see opportunities here for Villarreal to maybe cause an upset at home? If Villarreal beats you but I won't really say it's an upset because Let's look at UV and Atalanta are more or less similar in terms of strength this season. Yeah. And Villarreal were able to beat Atalanta. So I don't I don't think beating UV will be too much of a shock. It's going to be difficult without Moreno, but for the first leg, I looked at UV's like um squad list and 
you won't have Chiellini and Dybala, and Dybala. So, yeah, both teams were missing important players. And I don't know. Villarreal have a chance to beat me, to be honest. As for Vlahovic, I don't really know. He, he scored on his debut. But, I mean, I guess it takes time to adapt to a new team. Like, so. Yeah, and he is playing under Allegri, which is like playing under Simeone. And yeah, it's worse than playing under Simeone. Yeah, for strikers, you need to be a special breed to really do well. So, yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be a fascinating game. Like, yeah. I wish them luck. I wish their vice president luck. Um, yeah. Health-wise, because it came out that he had uh, leukemia this week. Yeah, this mm-hmm. week, so I wish yes. him all of the strength in the world. Yeah. And let's move on to the other the other team in Valencia, Elche. They played against Rayo and Rayo. You felt maybe this was the game they finally won, but no, Elche. The spirit in that team is too high at the moment. They're the best I saw you put on La Liga um, News English on Instagram. They're the best performing team in. Um, in 2022 in La Liga this season, which is incredible. And Peremia, your favorite player, he, he played a role in the in the final goal. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I have to say on Rayu, like, again, you know that thing about shoot passing, when you should have shot, yeah. shoot when you should have passed. They, they, their decision-making, the final third in the first half didn't help them. But even after taking the lead, Elche showed resilience, they showed a great fighting spirit that has been typical of Francisco's era. And Ponce got his first goal for the club. It's very important for Elche, actually, that all of the forwards are pitching in with goals, especially when Lucas Boye is in. Yeah. And, and this is the type of, like, run that, like, if you're a team like Elche, that you know you're going to be struggling to survive, this sort of run that you really need from your mm-hmm. team, like, just, like, String like when you're hot, you have to take advantage, maximum advantage of it, and that's yeah. what Elche is doing. That's what Rayo did in the first half of the season. Mm-hmm. But on Rayo, it's I have worried for them because the next two games are against Real Madrid and Real Betis, so the first, the best team in the league, and the third best team in the league. And it's you struggle to see where the wins are going to come from either in the league or in the cup. And with what's going on with the fans, like it just feels like it feels like chaotic right now. And I hope I feel like Rayo won't take the won't like play a lot of their important players against Real Madrid because they have the cup on this thing. They have the cup a few days later. It's the same thing because I saw we I forgot to mention this earlier, but Berenguer got himself suspended for the Barcelona game yeah. this Sunday on purpose because they have the cup. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that both teams. Especially Rayo, since they have Real Madrid and it's already so difficult. I'm just going to rotate some players and focus on getting the getting that great opportunity to play in the cup final. Yeah, and honestly, you like it would upset me like if they do that, but you can't really blame them because yeah, you can't you can't really blame them. And Rayo winning a cup would be something one in a millennium, right? Yeah, it and. That's the reason why a team like Rayo gets into a comfortable position in the league where they don't have to worry about anything because right now, like, they're not really going to challenge for Europe. Mm -hmm. They're not, most likely, they're not really going to get relegated. Two more wins, and I believe they'll be safe. So it's, you might as well focus on like what you can, on winning something actually. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, even whether you get to the final or not, you need to address this league form because. Losing yeah. becomes a habit, and if this carries on into next season, we'll see Levante 2.0. Yeah, but yeah, it took them, and it's like they're, they're a similar type of team. It's like they haven't really, like in the first half, Rio were they were fun to watch. Like I would wake up early in the morning just to watch them, but like yeah. right now, it feels like they don't really have that same spark, that same enthusiasm. It's like, like again, it's like when we're speaking of our Ralph that it's or even Atletico, something has gone wrong on a fundamental yeah. I'll even dare so dare I say spiritual level on to to them and hopefully it changes soon. Uh let's move on to the final game we had Cade Petafe. Um they shared the spoils in this game. Not not were there really any talking points that we can really talk about in this game besides the fact that like two teams that Hatafe, they they seem to be safe. I, I think, or maybe they're not safe, but I, I feel they will be safe. Kadip, 
it's getting more difficult for them to come out of that drop zone. Well, this was, I think when I look at the game, Cad has had the slightly better opportunities to win it, but yeah. they couldn't take advantage of Granada's terrible form. Because Granada have lost five in a row, or yeah. is it six? So, and they're slowly slipping back into that relegation conversation. But I think that Cadiz have been in the bottom three for so long that, you know, it feels like difficult for them to come out. Yeah. But they, because they have some quality players, I think they can make this relegation fight interesting. Interesting. And I believe that. Atafe, I think Atafe will be safe yeah. if they keep on it. Granada Cadiz, if I'm not wrong. Is Grand is. To be honest, if Espanyol keep not winning, I worry for about them a little bit. But most likely, it's between Granada, Cadiz, and Alaves. Unless, unless Levante, who <laughs> an absolute miracle. Yeah, they put, they're, they're, they're in action tonight against Salsa. When today changes the entire dynamic of that relegation fight. But like the next game is Granada Cadiz, and that could be like vital if Granada wins. It, it's almost like a a big haymaker on Cadiz. Yeah, if Granada wins, the difference is set, the difference from four becomes seven. Right? Yeah. Provide and if Mallorca and then get Grand and Catafe get good results that same weekend, I think the bottom three settled at that point. Yeah. So Cadiz, this is a fine, like Zizi would say. To find out. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, now let's move on to Europe. Let's start with in England because Manchester City, they looked they looked vulnerable. And in Europe, they, they were brilliant against sports and CD, but in in domestically recently, they've been dropping points all around and they lost three to Spurs. The now the difference in themselves in Liverpool is potentially three points. It's it's a title race in England right now. Uh, yeah, it's true. The Titleist could be back. And I don't know who's who is Liverpool's game in hand against. It's against Leeds. Oh, okay. Yeah, and Leeds are not in. Person. Leeds are not known for their defensive solidity, so a Titleist could be back. Yeah, I still think City will win it. Yeah, it's City and Pep have hacked the Premier League. Sure. And with the, with these two teams, like they're the favorites to win the Champions League. Do you like? Do you see either of them winning it, winning the Champions League this season? City and Liverpool. Yeah. Uh, uh, City. The problems with buying is is it the same thing every year. They destroy someone in the round of sixteen. They get a good matchup, a bad matchup for them. The quarterfinals and that. So I don't know. And how would happen? I felt last year. Last year was City's chance to win. Yeah, yeah, they had a very good chance last year. Yeah, this fun. this year, I wouldn't really say Liverpool are favorites too, but they have every chance to win it as well. They beat a good Inter side, yeah. where especially when they didn't even play as well as they could have. Sure, sure, but it seems like anyone can beat Inter at the moment. Like they lost to Sassuolo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's true. That, that, that that's true, but. Yeah. Things that Inter against Liverpool played really well. They made almost no mistake. Yeah, it, it except was an, too. Yeah, it was an intense game that one. It's like it's one of those games where I would say Liverpool took advantage at the moment. Like they had mm-hmm. the moments to score, and they took they took advantage of that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like and the one thing I wonder is like I wonder whether having like an intense title race, if if that's what happens takes away from the focus away from Europe. Yeah, it, it does. It does. It, it, it depends on, it ultimately depends on you, how much you let that like split focus affect your performances. Yeah. But because we've seen Liverpool before have a good run in Europe and a good tie to this. So it's not something that's impossible to do. No, it's not. So, and let, let's move, let's talk about the Italian teams a bit quickly because mm-hmm. it's, a, yeah, it's a lot of them drop points. Napoli are in action today, but Atalanta lost. Juve dropped points today, uh, this weekend. Mm-hmm. Milan dropped points against Salentina. Mm-hmm. And Inter lost Sassuolo. What happened? 
Not this Serie A. Anyone can win this thing. <laughs> Napoli, if they win today, they will actually go level with AC Milan at the top of the table. Yeah. So it's it's going to be. I think the title now because of the drop points of Inter recent is between those three. Juve, they're, they're far anywhere. I, the fact that Juve are in the top four is a good thing because before they were so bad, far away. Yeah. Yeah. The title now. It's definitely between those three at the top. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree with that. And I, I want to talk about the Europa League a bit because we saw strange results. And that was BVB against Rangers. And Rangers, they won by four versus the one. Do you see us coming? Kind of. <laughs> Is Dortmund have these funny results in them? Dortmund are very capable of scoring four against Rangers, but yeah. this kind of result happens too often. And, and I've spoken to a Dortmund fan, and it, it feels like they're still waiting to the end of the season to see what happens in Marco Rosa. Like the Bundesliga is six points; it's not it's not yet over, but it is <laughs> it is Dortmund. Uh, so, but it, it seems with four two, which is their, the actual results. My bad. They can still turn it around in Ibrox, can't they? Yeah, they can. Because I, I don't know if someone like Haaland will be back for the second leg. Yeah. But even without him, they still have enough firepower to turn this around. The issue is, you know, at the back, they can be so suspect at the back. Yeah, and I guess that's why they were so keen on signing Nicolas Sule from Bayern. Mm-hmm. Just to show up that back line. But on the front line, it doesn't seem like Donny Malin has lived up to expectations, really. Mm. And the door yeah, we spoke about Mokwoko, like he hasn't gotten enough opportunities and he shined when he had it last season, I believe. Yeah. Mokwoko, he, he made a difference against Rangers when he came on. Also at the weekend, he played in their 6 0 win. And- Right. He scored and played well. So he saw they could give more chances to, especially as Marlon has been a surprising disappointment so far. Yeah. At PSV, Marlon was really good. So I expected he fits right into Dortmund. It just hasn't panned out that way. So they could do it giving other players, like the youngsters, chances. Yeah, that's true. And Finally, or like, let's quickly get hit on three points. Did you see Nantes PSG? Your boy Messi was in action. <laughs> no, you know, I'm laughing because Ligon. I just, I just, I just look at all the people that assumed Messi, Neymar, and Bappe are going to make teams look like amateurs. I see this result, I laugh. I'm like, <laughs> oh. And it's, it's sort of That's like credit to Nance. This was a amazing, that was an amazing performance from them. Yeah. And it's it's sort of ironic because like they have that big performance against Real Madrid and it, <laughs> they go and do this. And, it, and it, they looked almost normal. And did you see Neymar's penalty miss? Yeah, you know what we've talked about earlier in this spot, like scoring at the right time. Yeah. PSG got one goal back. If they had scored that penalty, Nance would have been worried. Yeah. But when you miss that penalty, every bit of momentum they had just left. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. And a French team that's going to be in Champions League action this week is Lille. Do they have any chance against Chelsea? The way Lille have defended that title this season, I'm going to just keep it simple and say no. Yeah. And it, it could happen because Chelsea, it could actually, okay, on a serious note, they could be, potentially beat Chelsea because Chelsea haven't had the haven't always had things go their way this season, especially since December, because they've had the problems with Lukaku fitting in or not, or you know, he's that problem with him and the coach, who to play up front, you know, relying on midfielders and other people to pitch in with goals because the forwards aren't exactly firing. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see that one. Yeah, extremely interesting. And um, the final Champions League game that we haven't spoken about is Ajax Benfica. In a word or two, who do you think will go through? Ajax. Ajax, why? Because I don't like Benfica. 
<laughs> okay, okay. Not just sour grapes, but you, you... <laughs> it's sour grapes. But okay, let, let, to be honest, both teams are having. Ajax have been really, really good this season. Like, yeah, I think they scored it's, it's, it's not talked about enough how good they've been. So I see them being too much for Benfica. Yeah, yeah, they, they scored a hundred goals already, and they've only been yeah. this season so far. Yeah, I I feel there'll be too much for them. Benfica are, are a good side too, but I I step above them. It would also be nice if Benfica went through because you know. Seeing the team that destroyed you do well in Champions League is a testament to how good they are. That is true. And with that, let, let's wrap it up. Thank you again, Oscar, for coming on this podcast. I really enjoyed our conversation. We touched on Thank you for having me. Yeah. And again, enjoy President's Day in the US, I believe. Yeah. Try yeah. and enjoy it. And hope you guys enjoy this conversation. And adios and see you next week, hopefully. <laughs>